Conclusion Accessing the archetypal powers of the mature masculine When Lord of the Flies, William Golding's classic novel about English schoolboys marooned on a tropical island, was recently redone in cinematic form, critics of the new movie asked why the story had been remade. Even though this latest film version of Golding's story may not be the best cinema, the answer is that this work, in whatever form, speaks directly and powerfully about the human situation on this planet. It may be that there never has been a time when the archetypes of the mature masculine, or the mature feminine, were dominant in human life. It seems that we as a species live under the curse of infantilism, and maybe always have. Thus, patriarchy is really porarchy, i.e., the rule of boys, and perhaps our human world has always rather resembled Golding's Island. But at least there used to be structures and systems, rituals, for evoking a greater level of masculine maturity than seems to be the rule in our anti-system, anti-ritual, anti-symbol world today. At least there were at one time sacred kings, upon whom the men in the realm could project their inner king and thus activate this masculine energy form indirectly in themselves. Certainly, for both good and ill, there was a time when the warrior energy was active and effective in shaping the lives of men and the civilizations they built. And, though always the prerogative of only a few, the magician was available to help individual men with their life problems and to gain for the society some control over the unpredictable world of nature and the lover was also held in high regard in the cultures that celebrated seers and prophets, cave painters and poets. All that is changed now, cashed in for personal wealth and self-aggrandizement, the currency of the day. Yet ours is a world that needs the masculine energies in their maturity more urgently than ever before in human history. It is a strange irony that at the very moment when all of civilization seems to be nearing its greatest initiation ever, from a fragmented, tribal way of life to a more whole, more universal life, that just at this moment, the ritual processes for turning boys into men have all but disappeared from the planet. Just at the time when it is necessary for survival that immaturity be replaced by maturity, that boys become men and girls become women, and that grandiosity be replaced by true greatness, we are thrown back upon our own inner resources as men, struggling toward a wiser future for ourselves and our world pretty much alone. Maybe this is as it should be. The evolutionary process has placed the powerful resources of the four masculine archetypes within every man and has called upon them in different periods of human history to solve difficult problems and to dare the unthinkable, to organize laws out of chaos, to stimulate enormous outpourings of creativity and generativity like those that produced early civilizations, to gain some capacity to steward nature, both inner and outer, and to arouse tender appreciation and relatedness. Perhaps this growth process of our species has also arranged for the radical internalizing and psychologizing of these forces in modern men. If ours is an age of individualism in the deepest as well as in the most shallow sense, then let us be individuals. Let us nurture and welcome great individuals, individual men who will, with the benevolence of ancient kings, the courage and decisiveness of ancient warriors, the wisdom of magicians, and the passion of lovers, move energetically to take up the challenge of saving a world that has been cast down before us. There are certainly global needs and work enough to keep every man busy for the foreseeable future. Our effectiveness in meeting these challenges is directly related to how we as individual men meet the challenges of our own immaturity. How well we transform ourselves from men living our lives under the power of boy psychology to real men guided by the archetypes of man psychology will have a decisive effect on the outcome of our present world situation. Techniques We have briefly sketched the dimensions of the problem in this short book. We have delineated the immature and the mature energy forms. We have shown something about how they interact with each other and how they give rise to each other, in their shadow forms and in their fullness. We have touched on some techniques for accessing them. In the pages remaining, we look more closely at some of these techniques for reconnecting appropriately with the archetypes of masculine maturity. The first step in doing this, for each of us, is critical self-appraisal. We have said that there is no use asking ourselves if the negative or shadow sides of the archetypes are showing up in our lives. The realistic, honest question we need to ask is how they are manifesting. Let us remember that the key to maturity, to moving from boy psychology to man psychology, is to become humble, to be grasped by humility. Humility is not humiliation. We're not asking any man to submit himself to humiliation at his own or other's hands. Far from it. But we all need to be humble. Let us recall that true humility consists of two things, the first is knowing our limitations, and the second is getting the help we need. Assuming that we all could use some help, we now look at four important techniques for accessing the positive resources we are missing in our lives. Active Imagination Dialogue 
In the first of these techniques, called in psychology active imagination dialogue, the conscious ego enters into dialogue with various unconscious entities, other focused consciousnesses, other points of view, within us. Behind these different points of view, sometimes in obscure ways, lie the archetypes, in both their positive and their negative forms. We all dialogue with ourselves anyway, but usually inefficiently, when we talk to ourselves. It's a joke, of course, that says, it's okay to talk to yourself, as long as you don't answer. But we do answer ourselves. And we do it all the time. We answer ourselves sometimes verbally, out loud, or in our heads. Often, though, we answer ourselves through the events and people that happen into our lives without our conscious willing or intention. We answer ourselves too by acting out a point of view or an attitude that we consciously abhor. Every man has had the experience, for example, of planning what to say and do before he enters a high-level meeting or goes off to yell at the repair shop for incompetent work, and then doing and saying something else. In the meeting, he had planned to keep his cool and calmly and firmly set out his point of view. But when others started getting upset, he suddenly found himself angrily trying to outshout his opponents. At the garage his planned tirade was cut short by an unexpectedly sympathetic-sounding desk clerk, and he ended by being congenial, when he knew well enough that the guy was just soft-soaping him. Two thousand years ago, Paul, in great frustration, asked himself the question, why do I do the things I don't want to do, and the very things I want to do, I can't? And, when the scene, whatever it is, is over, we say to ourselves, I don't know what came over me. What came over us, what changed our planned words and behaviors, is what psychology calls an autonomous complex, and behind it what we are calling a pole in a bipolar archetypal shadow. It pays to face these rebellious and often negative energy forms before they make us say and do things we regret. Active imagination dialogue is one important technique for actually holding conversations, board meetings, conference calls with these energy forms that wear our faces but are timeless and universal. In active imagination dialogue we talk with them, contacting one or more of them and giving our point of view. Then we listen for their replies. Often, it is best to do this on paper, writing both the ego's thoughts and feelings and the opponent's thoughts and feelings just as they come, without censoring them. As in any successful board meeting, we at least need to agree to disagree. Under extremely hostile circumstances, we need to reach a simple truce, if possible, at least for the time being. At a minimum, this kind of exercise will help us to scope out the opposition and get most of the cards on the table. Forewarned is forearmed. This exercise may seem strange at first. But usually just a few moments of writing will reveal the reality of the other points of view within every man's psyche. It may happen that you draw a blank at first. But if you persist in talking to yourself, eventually you will be answered. The answers you get may be startling. They may be reassuring. But they will come. One word of caution, if in the course of this exercise you encounter a really hostile presence, what some psychologists call an inner persecutor, stop the exercise and consult a good therapist. Most of us probably have inner persecutors, as well as inner helpers. But the persecutor may be so vicious that you will need support to continue dialoguing with it. If you suspect you will run into one of these, it is best to invoke a positive archetypal energy form before you even open the dialogue. We talk about invocation in the next section. One more note, you may get in touch with more than one other point of view. Treat the dialogue, then, as a board meeting, and listen to what everybody has to say. What follows is an example of an active imagination dialogue exercise. The man who had this dialogue with one of his complexes, the trickster, had been having a lot of trouble at work because he found himself unable to contain his critical comments, most of which were based on accurate observations, about management's incompetence. He found himself ridiculing his boss in front of his fellow employees. He was unable to make it to work on time, and was unable to contain his restlessness and disgust in meetings, occasionally in direct one-on-one confrontations with his supervisor. The following is what happened happened when he sat down to try to get in touch with whatever was causing him to behave this way, ego. Who are you? Who are you? What do you want? Whoever you are, you're getting me in trouble, trickster. Isn't that interesting, ego? Oh, so there is someone there, trickster. Don't be a smart ass, of course, there's someone here, I wish I could say the same for you, the lights are on, but nobody's home, ego. What do you want with me, trickster? Well, let me think about it. You know what I want, you idiot. I want to make your life miserable, ego. Why, trickster? Why, because it's fun, you think you're so cool. Just imagine if you got fired, boy, that would be fun, ego. Who are you, trickster? My name isn't important. What's important is that I'm here, ego. 
Why do you want to make my life miserable? Why is that fun for you, trickster? Because you deserve a miserable life, I'm miserable, ego. Why are you miserable, trickster? Because of what you've done to me, ego. Me done to you, trickster. Yeah, you jerk, ego. What have I done to you, trickster? You don't care about me, so don't pretend that you do, ego. I do care, I want to care, trickster. Yeah, because you're uncomfortable, ego. That's right, you and I have to settle things between us, trickster. No, we don't, you just have to get fired, ego. I won't let you get me fired, trickster. Just try to stop me. After more mutual accusation and expressions of distrust, the man's ego and this inner figure, which was the trickster archetype wearing the man's own personal shadow identity, began serious conversation. Trickster. You put down your real feelings about things, all of your feelings. You're a wimp. I am your feelings, your real feelings. I want to be angry sometimes, and I want to be really glad. And you just wimp around, acting superior. Any superiority you have is in me. I'm the real you. Ego. I want to be your friend. And, I need you to be mine. You are not me. I have my own point of view, and I need you to hear it. But I really will turn over a new leaf. At the same time, I can't let you just blurt things out at work. If I go hungry, so do you. We're in this together, you know. Trickster. Yeah, okay. But you're going to have to pay attention to me. We've got vacation time coming up, and I want to go someplace this year. Wine, women, song. So, you're going to have to buy some clothes, and a ticket to someplace, I'd like the tropics. And, what's more, and don't be shocked, I want to get laid. Ego. It's a deal. And you take the pressure off of me at work, or we'll be on permanent vacation. Trickster. That was the idea. I was going to force you to take a vacation of some kind. Just don't back out on our deal. Ego. I won't. Trickster. Then it's a deal. Often, conducting a dialogue with inner opponents, usually forms of the immature masculine energies, will diffuse much of their power. What they, like all children, really want is to be noticed, honored, and taken seriously. And they have a right to be. Once they are honored, and their feelings validated, they no longer need to act out through our lives. This conflict ended amicably, and what had been a non-relationship became a new source of balance in this man's life. His trickster had finally deflated him, and had done so in order to force him to fulfill aspects of his personality that he had ignored. A figure who started out as an inner persecutor became a lifelong friend. In this next example of active imagination dialogue, the man's ego acted as a referee for two conflicting aspects of his personality, one showing the influence of the immature hero energy and the other the lover. The two archetypes were in conflict about how to treat the woman in the man's life. The hero wanted to conquer her, while the lover wanted to just relate to her on a mutual basis. This is how the dialogue went. Ego. All right, you two. We've got a problem. Gail wants to go to Brazil on a lark, without us. You, hero, want to blast her for it and deliver an ultimatum, either drop the trip and come to Chicago to visit you instead, or forget the relationship. And you, lover, just want to let her go and love her no matter what. So, we have to decide something here. Hero. She's being selfish. As usual, she's trying to overwhelm me with her impulsive desires. She doesn't care about me. She's dangerous. And if I'm going to be in a relationship with her, I'm going to have to lay down the law. Lover. Yes, but that takes all the fun out of it. She has to want to be with us, or it's no good. I'll love her no matter what she does. I'm so in love with her, if you try to control her, you'll ruin what real love is. Hero. Don't give me that romantic crap. Maybe you want to lie down and take this, but I can't. How can you even think about living with such a selfish and impulsive woman? Lover. Because, selfish and impulsive or not, she's the woman I love. Hero. But there's no kind of security with this woman. Lover. There's also no security in forcing someone to do what you want against their own wishes. Love loves just for the pure joy of loving. Hero. Well, maybe you can live with pure joy, but I can't. I will defeat her willfulness or die trying. Lover. What will die is the relationship. Ego. Okay. You've each presented your point of view. Now, we've got to come to some kind of agreement. It seems to me you're both right, but both excessive. The hero is right in setting reasonable limits on the relationship, and in recognizing our own limits, what we are comfortable with. 
Gail's going to Brazil instead of coming to Chicago is beyond endurance. And the lover is right in not wanting to blow off the relationship, and in wanting to respect Gail's limits and her desires. But, lover, you have to realize that human love does have limits. It is not limitless. Oh, the love may be. But what we can live with is not. So, let's both set limits and love Gail at the same time. Because the hero, under the influence of the lover, was able to transform his fear and anger into courage and limit setting, something Gail was actually looking for, Gail did not go to Brazil and is maturing in the relationship. And the split psyche of the man is becoming integrated. Invocation A second technique we call invocation. This time we access the masculine archetypes in their fullness as positive energy forms. This too may seem strange at first. But a moment's reflection will reveal to us that we do this kind of thing all the time. We all live our psychological lives unintentionally, for the most part, invoking images and thoughts that may or may not be helpful to us. Our minds are cluttered with sights, sounds, and words, many of which are unwanted. To see the truth of this, just close your eyes for a moment. Images will present themselves in the darkness, and thoughts, barely audible to the inner ear, will crowd into your mind. If active imagination dialogue is a conscious, focused way of talking to yourself, invocation is a conscious, focused way of calling up the images you want to see. Imaging deeply affects our moods, our attitudes, the way we look at things, and what we do. It is therefore important what thoughts and images we are invoking in our lives. Here's how to do focused imaging, or invocation. If possible, find a quiet place and time, clear your mind as best you can and relax, again, as best you can. We don't recommend long relaxation exercises as a necessary part of this process, although they can be helpful. Focus on an image that has both mental pictures and spoken words, spoken in your head, at least. It is often useful to spend some time looking for images of the king, the warrior, the magician, the lover. Use those images in your invocations. Let's say you've found an image of a Roman emperor on his throne, a still from a movie, perhaps, or a painting. During this exercise, set that image in front of you. As you relax, talk to the image. Call up the king inside yourself. Seek to merge your deep unconscious with him. Realize that you, as an ego, are different from him. In your imagination, make your ego his servant. Feel his calm and his strength, his balanced benevolence toward you, his watching over you. Imagine yourself before his throne, having an audience with him. In effect, pray, to him. Tell him that you need him, that you need his help, his power, his favor, his orderliness, his manliness. Count on his generosity and his kind disposition. A young man once entered therapy feeling very out of touch with his erotic side. He just couldn't make a chemical connection with women. He wanted more than anything else to find a woman who would love him, a woman with whom he could have an exciting sex life, a woman he could marry. Part of the prescription in his therapy was to read all he could about the Greek god of love, Eros, especially the Cupid, Eros, and Psyche story, and then to pray to Eros to help him to feel sensual and attractive. Shortly after he began his invocations of this image of the lover, he went on a cruise. There he met, quite unexpectedly, a beautiful woman who felt that he was the most handsome, manly man she'd ever seen. She was experiencing the newfound eros within him, which was filling his whole personality with its force and radiance. She even said to him, you're as handsome as a god. Several nights out, they made passionate love in the sea, the most wonderful sexual experience of his life. The two stayed in touch with each other after the cruise, and within a year they were married, with a baby on the way. He attributes his new, more rewarding life to his imaging and invocations of the lover. Another man found himself needled and attacked by several female co-workers for his self-confident, manly ways. He found strength in a crystal pyramid that he kept on his desk. The pyramid form, as we have seen, is a symbol for the masculine self. Whenever he felt overwhelmed, he would take a 60-second breather. He would turn to his pyramid and imagine it inside himself, in his chest. The waves of the emotional attacks on his manhood crashed against its sides, trying to fragment it. But the waves always fell back, eventually spending their fury. His work situation didn't improve, but he was able to keep his balance, his calmness, and his centeredness most of the time, while he sought a better work environment. In the midst of a hectic day, this man could not fully ritualize his invocation. But many men, in the solitude of the late evening or the early morning, can. They sometimes even light candles and burn incense before an image of the archetype, honoring the archetype they are calling upon in an ancient, yet very appropriate, way. What we are suggesting is comparable to what religions have always called prayer, when that prayer was accompanied by ritual accessing of the god. 
Far from being idols, icons in Greek Orthodoxy and statues in Roman Catholicism serve to focus an image of the energy form that the believer is invoking. The image of the saint or god may become so fixed in a man's mind that he no longer has to have a graphic representation in front of him to feel the energies that flow from it. Admiring men Along the same lines is the related technique of admiration. Mature men need to admire other men, living and dead. We need especially to have contact with older men whom we can look up to. If such men are not available to us personally, we need to read their biographies and become familiar with their words and deeds. These men need not be perfect, because perfection, the realization of the completely whole man, can never be achieved. Movement toward wholeness is possible, however, and every man is individually responsible for it. It is precisely at our weak points, at those places within our psyches where we are possessed by the poles of an archetypal shadow system that we need to invoke, through active admiration, the strengths we lack but can appreciate in others. If we need more of the warrior in our lives, we may come to know and appreciate the warrior soul of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II, of the Zulu chief who threw himself and his men so courageously against the British in the 19th century Zulu uprising, or of George Patton. If we need to more adequately access the king energy, we might study the life of Abraham Lincoln or Ho Chi Minh. If we need more lover, we might admire the lover energy of Leo Buscaglia. The point is that what images and thoughts we invoke determine to a large extent not only how things look to us but how they actually are. A shift in our inner accessing of the archetypes of the mature masculine will affect a change in the outer circumstances and opportunities of our lives. At the very least, a changed inner world will greatly enhance our capacity to deal with difficult circumstances and eventually turn them to better advantage, for us, for those we love, and for our companies, our causes, and the world. There's a saying in this connection, be careful what you wish for, you may get it. The much-touted power of positive thinking is at least partially true, truer than most of us think. So while we are critically evaluating where we stand in relationship to the masculine energies, and while we are engaged in a dialogue with both positive and shadow aspects of them, we need also to be invoking the archetypes in their fullness in deliberate and focused ways. Acting, as if. There is yet another technique for accessing the archetypes of the mature masculine that deserves brief mention because it is so obvious it may get overlooked. It relies on the time-validated technology of the actor trying to get into character when he doesn't feel the character. We call this acting as if. In this process, if you can't feel the character portrayed in your script, you begin by acting like the character. You move and talk as this character would move and talk. You act as if. On the stage, you act kingly, even if you've just been fired from your job and your wife has left you. The show must go on, and others are depending on you to play your part well. So you pick up your script, you read the king's lines, you sit on the throne, and you act like the king. Pretty soon, believe it or not, you will start to feel like a king. It's quite odd, but if you need to access more of the lover, for example, and sunsets don't interest you, go out and really look at a sunset. Act as if you appreciate it. Notice the colors. Force yourself to see the beauty. Even say to yourself, oh, yes, look at those oranges and reds, and the subtle transition from blue to purple. Pretty soon, strange as it may seem, you really may find yourself becoming interested in the sunset. If you need to access more of the warrior, you might start by getting up from the television set some evening and forcing yourself out the door for a vigorous walk. You might take up a martial art. You might start an exercise class. You might force yourself to start on the unpaid bills piled on your desk. Get up. Move around. Start some action. And soon, much to your amazement, you may find yourself acting more like a warrior in many areas of your life. If you need to access the magician more consciously, the next time someone comes to you for your wisdom, act as if you really have some. Act as if you really do have something helpful and insightful to say. Force yourself to really listen to this person. Try to clear your mind of your own agenda and really focus on the problem he or she is presenting to you. Then, as thoughtfully as you can, give that person as much of your accumulated life's wisdom as you can. We all have much more of this than we think we do. A final word. In this book we have been concerned about helping men to take responsibility for the destructiveness of immature forms of masculinity. At the same time, it is clear that the world is overpopulated with not only immature men but also tyrannical and abusive little girls pretending to be women. It is time for men, particularly the men of Western civilization, to stop accepting the blame for everything that is wrong in the world. There has been a veritable blitzkrieg on the male gender, what amounts to an outright demonization of men and a slander against masculinity but women are no more inherently responsible or mature than men are. 
The high chair tyrant, for instance, appears in all her or his splendor in both sexes. Men should never feel apologetic about their gender, as gender. They should be concerned with the maturation and the stewardship of that gender and of the larger world. The enemy for both sexes is not the other sex but infantile grandiosity and the splitting of the self that results from it. A final word of encouragement, any transformative process, like life itself, takes time and effort. We do our homework from the conscious side, and the unconscious, with its powerful resources, will, if approached in the right way, respond to our questions, our needs, and our woundedness in healing and generative ways. The struggle for maturity is a psychological, moral, and spiritual imperative from the Chinese emperor within every man. Joseph Campbell, in his last book, The Inner Reaches of Outer Space, called for a worldwide awakening to a kind of initiation that would become a rallying point for a deepened human sense of responsibility and maturity. Initiation, as we talk about it, is really a matter of exploring the outer reaches of inner space. We wish to add our voices to those of the many men throughout history who, against enormous odds, through their lives and through their teachings, have called for an end to the reign of the Lord of the Flies, the apocalyptic fantasy of the end of the world in a final display of infantile rage. If contemporary men can take the task of their own initiation from boyhood to manhood as seriously as did their tribal forebears, then we may witness the end of the beginning of our species, instead of the beginning of the end. We may pass between the clashing Skyla and Charybdis of our grandiosity and our chauvinistic tribalism and move beyond them into a future as wonderful and as generative as any depicted in the myths and legends that the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover have bequeathed to us.